Hello, everyone. I hope you all had a good DevOps and that you still have some energy left for the last talk. I do. Um, and what better way to start off a talk than with a little story, a tale, an anecdote? Some, some years ago, I, I joined a new company. And with that, I, I joined a new team. And the team itself was a new, newly formed team within that company. And we received a new project. Although the project itself was not a new project, it was actually an existing project that was actively developed on by another team in another country even. And the project itself just received its first production release. So actual customers could use it in production. And to ease over the transition, they... Um, oh, sorry. So the, the uh, management decided that the project should move from that one team abroad to the newly formed team. And to ease over the transition, they decided to install some handover days. So both teams got together, and we learned about the application, the domain, the technical side of things, and we quickly noticed something. We couldn't find any tests. So, so naturally, we went to the other team and asked, like, where, where are the tests? And they responded by saying, well, well there are no tests. We, we, we don't write tests. That's, that's weird, right? Why, why wouldn't you write tests? And they answered by saying, well, we don't write tests because we don't write bugs. And, and th this is exactly what this talk is about. Why would you write tests? What do you test and how do you test that? And I can assure you that the answer to the first question, why do you write tests, is not simply because we all write bugs. In a way, this, 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 this story is a bit sad, a bit arrogant, and marginally funny. But if I reflect upon myself and my own ideas and concepts around testing, I can't say that they've been that great either all the time. And, and to illustrate that, I, I would like to go back in time yet again. And this time to the beginning of time, to that moment I first started working as a developer. I don't know for you guys, but for me, it was quite daunting. You have to imagine, this was a world without Spring Boot. If you had a Spring project, you were lucky. Because else, you had to fight off dragons like EGB and kill monsters like OSGI, struts. But in any case, I managed. But unlike that other team, I was introduced to a team back then that wrote tests. So from day one, I was exposed to testing. But to be honest, like my focus was not really on writing tests. I was very much focused on writing production code. The, the young developer that I was was already happy if the code just worked. And naturally, I wrote the test because I had to. But like I said, it was not my focus. So in, in that moment in time, I kind of assumed that I had to write tests, write tests simply to verify the correctness of the code in the moment, at the moment you're writing your test, in that little window. But then time goes on and, and you grow as a developer, right? You, you go to conferences, read books, and you start to realize there's actually much more to testing than simply verifying correctness. For one, there's, it helps you prevent regression. We all know what it is, right? Now, one project, we were constantly battling regression. Why? Because we were unable to refactor our code. You know how it goes, right? You receive a project, a completely new one, and every, every developer, every team has certain ideas on style or how to do things. So we wanted to apply our style to that project. We wanted to do things our way. We quickly halted that because, yeah, we were causing regression. We were unable to refactor freely in a safe way. Tests allow us to evolve our system at a steady pace. And, and that is so much more than simply verifying the correctness of code. Now, one system we received was unable to evolve, was hard to evolve, even to the point that management started to ask questions like, what is going on, guys? Now, one team never had any issues with them. And you guys, if you ship anything, you break things constantly. What management didn't realize, for one, is that yeah, the project just went live, so they, the time that the other team had to develop it, well, the, the, the project was not really used. 
And another thing was, they didn't write tests. So yeah, naturally, when you don't write tests, your speed, your velocity will be high. But what, what will happen inevitably is it will plummet down. You will have to fight regression. You will be unable to evolve your system. What tests give you is the evolvability at a steady pace. It allows us to go forward indefinitely. Yes, that initial curve will be a bit steeper. When we received the project, it didn't come with any kind of documentation, and those few days of handover weren't merely enough to really grasp the, the, the system itself. And afterwards, the, the, the other team was also not really, was quite reluctant to answer our questions, so we were left in the dark a bit sometimes. And there were no tests. Because if there were tests, we could start reading them. Because tests actually define the boundaries of our system, right? They tell us what falls in and what falls out. And, and there, are, there are actually much more than those stale pieces of documentation we sometimes have to write on wikis, which start to drift from our code. There are li living pieces of documentation. Because if I have to write a feature, I write a test for that. If I alter that feature, and I don't alter that test, in theory, my build should fail. So we're forced to update our test. They're executable pieces of documentation. Again, much more than simply verifying correctness. They guide our design. TDD, right? It's very, very much at the forefront of this, where you first write your test, then you write the simplest implementation possible, and then you refactor over it until the design is good enough for you, beautiful. We all know that, that Code that is hard to test is often smelly. There's something wrong with the design, right? Code should be easy to test. Let tests guide you. And all these traits, these good traits of test together, allow us to continuously release with confidence. Because that's what I want to be as a developer. I want to feel safe. I want to be able to ship my product on a Friday evening and go home. And then time goes on and when I learned all these things, I thought that yeah, testing is great. But when I looked around, I found that the reality of tests was sometimes a bit different. I found tests to be brittle sometimes. Simply adding a dependency, changing a parameter, just reshaping the code, not really changing the behavior, but just the shape of the code would break tests, sometimes in remote places of the code base. Sometimes I've found tests to be really, really complex for relatively simple production code. Hence, they were hard to maintain. They did not guide. TDD is a bit like teenage sex. Everyone's talking about it, but who's actually doing it? Sometimes I've found tests to be cryptic. I, I encountered tests and I had no clue by the test method name what was being actually tested, let alone if I read the body of the, of the method. And sometimes even worse, the test method said one thing, okay, great, you read the body and it said something else. So either one of the two is lying or we need two tests. And sometimes they were horrendously slow. I worked once in a team and they found it completely normal that the test time was one hour for a rather small application. And the worst of all, like that one team, skipping testing. So surely the benefits of, of, of writing tests, running and maintaining them, should outweigh the cost. And I think there's a kind of paradox going on here, because at, at, at one hand, most developers really value testing. They, they really think testing is important. But that is seldom reflected in the test code. And there's another paradox going on here, on a code level. Because most developers really care about the code, they're meticulous about it. We're all about clean code, right? At least, that's for the production code. The test code it seems to be different. I find that a paradox. And, and, and the last paradox I, 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 I identified was on an architectural level. Because architecture is all around us, right? No application is designed without considering architecture somehow. We create diagrams, C4, architectural decision records, 
We have people walking around in the office calling themselves an architect, and it doesn't stop there. We have different types of architects. Solution, enterprise, application architects. But all of this architecture we do is for our production code. Seldom, rarely, we turn around and look at the test code. Because then I qu question myself, like, don't we find our test important to be considered? Because that is, for me, what architecture is about, the important stuff. Also our tests. And we're when we're doing architecture, we're constantly making trade-offs. When our tests are slow, when our tests are brittle, or hard to maintain, there were trade-offs there that we didn't make. And we constantly make them in our production code. Architecture guides us. If I start working on, a, on, a, on an existing project that I don't know, um, I often reside to the architectural diagrams, the ADRs, stuff like that, to, to really understand what is the meaning of the architecture. But that's always for the production code. The test code, there's nothing. So I, I start to wonder, like, why, how did we end up here? Why is this happening? And I think a lot of it stems from that initial premise I said at the beginning of my career. That we're so focused in the moment when you're writing production code, because that's the task at hand, right? That's what you get paid for. And you, you, it's very hard to leave that moment. And, and you do not only write a test in the current moment for the current moment, simply to verify correctness. That's only part of the story. So let's try to answer the three W's. And let's start with, why do we write tests? Well, I think we write tests to cope with change. Because requirements change. Integrations change. Security, technology, data formats, deployment methods, people, and organizations themselves change. And let me give you an example of, of change. I once had to work on a, on a system, and it was a, an existing system, and it was actually developed a decade ago. And the task was very simple. Uh, they finally decided to like, kick out the, that COBOL mainframe, and everybody who was talking to that COBOL mainframe had to now talk to the cloud. So they found a cloud solution to replace COBOL. And my job was simply to not change the requirements in this case, but change the integration. I had to make sure that that system was able to talk to the cloud. And when I went along implementing this, uh, I looked at the commit logs and I found interesting things. Yes, the first like two years, there were a lot of requirements being built and added, but then it kind of halted and it was like a void. And then I found security patches. I found that people, I found that they were deploying the application as a WAR file first, deployment methods, and then they kind of switched to a jar, Spring Boot, one, two, and while, while I was there, I decided, uh, let's go for three then. And I also found that, hey, in the beginning, they were deploying it as a WAR in an application server, and in this point in time, they were deploying it in the cloud, Kubernetes. I also found that throughout that decade, Dozens of people have committed and worked on that. Even people, I asked my colleague, who's Mark? He said, I've never met Mark here. So things constantly change, and that is why we test. And that's the key characteristic of software, change. And tests allow us to change things. Tests are change enablers. Other things in software are obviously also important. But if you're unable to change a thing, you will never make it faster, more secure, resilient, whatever you want it to be. And test gave us that ability. And that is so much more than simply verifying correctness. So the reason for writing tests is change, adaptability, to evolve. What do we actually test? What is the system under test? And let's go back again in time to that, that younger version of myself and ask this question. I think I would have answered something in the lines of, well, you, you, you asked me to, to write production code. That's the job at hand, right? So I write code and I write test code to test the code. So 
can't testing the code. That's what I'm testing, obviously. And that, that's true. You can't say it's not right. You are testing the code. But you are testing that implicitly. What you want to test explicitly is something else. So let's answer the following question first. What do we actually write code for? And I'm a bit of a geek. I, I really don't need any reasons to, to write code. I just love solving puzzles. I don't need business value, but surely that's not the case, right? Why we all write code? We write code because there's someone who has a pack of money, let's be honest. And that someone wants a system to behave in a certain way. He has a requirement for a system to behave. That's why we write code. We don't write code for code. When I was young, in the beginning of my, my, my career, I often had this false assumption. That was my trigger for writing tests. And this comes from a really good talk by Ian Cooper. But the trigger for writing a test is not a new class, not a new public method. That was something I was constantly doing. I was writing a new public method, and I thought, like, let's write a class for that, very much driven by this idea of code coverage. I thought I was doing good, and I was doing good, but I think we can do better. So what is the trigger then? Well, the trigger is behavior. And to a lesser extent, the code, as we'll see later. But the main trigger for most people, for most business application, oriented application, is the behavior, not the code. And you should test your behavioral contract Whatever that means technically, and the last sentence is, is quite important. Because when I'm in the office and, and talking about this behavioral stuff, sometimes colleagues come to me and they, they tell me, you probably only want, want us to write integration tests and then we'll just capture the behavior. No, I didn't imply that. When, I, when I'm saying test the behavior, I don't imply any type of test. That's a different thing. You should not confuse that. And we're, when we're talking about the different types of tests, integration tests or unit tests, it's interesting to, to take a look at the ancient pyramid. And I question, is this still relevant? And what are the alternatives? We all know this pyramid, right? Like at the bottom, we write lots and lots of fast and cheap unit tests, and above that layer above, we write lesser, uh, fewer integration tests, which are a bit more slow and expensive, and as less as possible, slow and expensive end-to-end -end tests. But I don't think this is really relevant, because if I would have asked 10 people in this room, give me a definition of a unit test, I'd probably receive eight different ones. Because we simply can't agree on what a unit test is. And I don't want to be bogged down by, by conversations like, Jonas, you know, you just named this thing an integration test, but actually it's a component test. Is that relevant? Does that help us? I don't think so. Because the type of test is how you're doing things. It's technical detail. It's, it's seldom really relevant. And we should try to step away from that and try to step away from the classical pyramid. What you want to test is an integration, a behavior, or an implementation detail. And that is much more relevant. And they also make shapes for that, the testing honeycomb. Online, you'll find a different version of this thing. And this is a slightly altered uh, my own custom interpretation. Um, so let's start. For one, you can see there are four layers. At, uh, at the bottom, we find the static triangle. Well, what is static? Static is your static code analyzers, like Sonar in the Java world. Then you have fewer, at the bottom, implementation detail tests. And we'll delve into that later. And then you want to have lots of behavior tests, feature tests, use case tests. And that does not imply any type of test. Also, implementation detail test. That does not imply unit test, integration test. It can be anything. You can have a unit test eh, that is an implementation detail test, but you can also test an implementation detail to an integration test. And the same goes for your behavior. 
we should focus on that. And at the top, we have integrated test. Don't get confused by integration test, an integrated test. And what is an integrated test? An integrated test is simply a test that runs against a real environment. Death can even be production. Let me give you an example of an integrated test. In the current project I'm working on, we have something called the sanity tester. We call it nicknamed the non. And what this thing does actually is when we deploy something, it fires off certain requests to our API and kind of smoke tests things. And you might wonder, why would you do that? Well, because today's world is a bit different than 10 years ago, right? In the past, we would write like this big monolithic applications, and next to it, we have like this Oracle database. That's not true anymore. Today's world is microservice, right? And, and, and that's not only it. Next to that, in this microservice landscape, we also have lots of tools floating around. I don't have this SQL database anymore. Well, I do, but I also have other tools, like we use Elastic for search, because that's a really good tool for that. And for example, in the current project, we're heavily reliant on Kafka. And on Kafka, we use Avro, so we use the schema registry. And what often happens is that, or sometimes, not often, but sometimes it happens, and that we forget to actually apply the Elasticsearch index when we deploy, because that is actually living in a separate repository. It's living in our, one of our Terraform repositories, away from the code. And my code can be green. Like I can have 100% code coverage. But still, if I deploy, things might break, because that Terraform module has a mistake in there. Or some other service is depending on something I didn't apply it correctly. Well, a sanity test, an integrated test in your environment, might catch these things very early without you having to click and see, suddenly see like, oh, this doesn't work anymore. On the subject of implementation detail tests, I would like to look at this requirement. And, uh, an email uh, notification should be sent to the receiver once an invoice has been paid. It's a fairly simple requirement, right? And that is defined by the email service, Java interface. And it's implemented by the SES email service. Um, SES, if you don't know, stands for Simple Email Service. It's an it's a AWS component you can use to send emails. So in full, this thing reads actually the Simple Email Service email service. OK, we're done. We've implemented this. The requirement is working. It's deployed. It's being used in production. And after a year, you get some, some feedback, and you see, actually, we thought we are going to send out millions of emails, but uh, that's actually not true. It was a false assumption. We're only <laughs> sending out a couple of emails a month. So that SES service, like the cloud is not for free, right? It's quite, quite expensive. So maybe we should switch to that old SMTP server we have here. Should do, be fine. Should save us some bucks. Let's do that. So what we do, obviously, we make an SMTP email service implementation and we switch. And now my question goes, should that requirement test fail because I made an implementation detail change? No. And this is something to think about when you're designing your test. Sometimes people ask me the question like, what makes a test an implementation detail test? And what makes a test a behavioral test? Sometimes it's bloody obvious, right? But sometimes there's a very thin line, and, and the world is not black and white. It's not that simple. Another example or analogy is, is a, a little pet project of mine. Um, like I said, I love writing code, so I started in the weekend writing a, an uh, XML mapper. Well, I first started with writing a uh, SAX parser, and now, based on that SAX parser, I'm writing an XML mapper. Uh, the project now is called XGX. But the, the interface, not the Java interface, obviously, but the, the application interface looks like this. And it's very simple, right? It looks a bit like our Jackson object mapper, where we give it a XML document, and you say, I want it to be mapped on this class, and I'll give you the class. And I started implementing this thing and, and writing tests for that, focused on the behavior. And after a while, I, I realized, like, ah, this ain't going to cut it. 
I was at like 80% of something of the, the full implementation. I thought like, I learned a lot. I would never do it like that. And actually, I'm a bit stuck. I don't like this design. So what do you do? Agile way, right? You take a step back. And you learn from your mistakes. So let's, let's, let's just imagine that um, this application interface is represented by this rectangle. And the behavior is clear, right? You have some kind of input, depending on the input. You have some kind of output. And I wrote my test against those arrows, basically. And then you had my first implementation. And I thought, like, nah, this, this is not going to work. So away with it. I think about 80% of the classes I just threw away, and some 20% I decided to, to reuse because yeah, they were useful. And I replaced it. And you know what happened? I'm not going to say that 100% of my tests were green. No, but 80% of my tests were green. Why? Because I was testing against that behavior. That was the most important thing. I was not constantly focused on testing these individual classes and their methods. They're in a way ephemeral. And that 20% that failed, that was because I was testing some implementation detail that changed. And also along the way, I decided to change the behavior a bit, some annotation that had another meaning. Another uh, analogy I like to use is one from um, Wim Davois. Wim Davois is, a, is a, an artist, and he makes art installations. And um, this one is called the Cloaca. And um, it's actually the name of the uh, ancient uh, sewer in Rome. And what does the Cloaca do? Well, uh, there's no other way to put it. The alternative name is the shit-making machine, basically, the poo machine. Because the behavior of this thing is simple. You put in a sandwich at one end, and at the other hand, yeah, shit comes out, feces come out. That's what he made. He made different versions of this thing, some more dark and grim. But the behavior is clear, right? He replicated the human digestive system in a way. But just imagine that, that you're testing all individual modules, all individual tubes and pumps and whatnot and connections. Those would be, in a way, implementation details. But if one of those pumps breaks, breaks down because your initial design was not good enough and you replace it, what do you want to fail when you replace it with a better version? That, that, that behavior is still the same, right? So how do we put this all into code? We already discussed why we write tests, right? Change, evolvability. What do we test? Behavior, and to a lesser extent, code, implementation details. So how do we put this all into code? And, and the first thing to note is that, that we're developers, right? And, and, and the first thing to note is that test and production code are actually different things. They live in different packages, different contexts, and different rules. You should not treat them in a way equal. To give an example, avoid abstractions. That this is something we, we do for the right reasons in our production code. We constantly make abstractions, polymorphism, hide things behind interfaces. But not, we should not do that too much in our test code if we value the documentation value of our tests. You want to keep your readers in your method. And you want to minimize the setup and teardown logic to only the technical. If I'm reading a test method, and you force me to jump out of that method all the way to the top of the clause, and then trace back to that test method, and if there are 20 tests in that clause, I already forgot which one it was. Or, or I'm, I'm reading a test method, and you force me down a trail of method calls just to find out what, why a value is being set in a certain way, and then have to trace back only to, to be led in another direction. That doesn't help me. You want to communicate clearly, you want to document, you want to keep me in that method. The cyclomatic complexity of a test should be one. That basically means avoid ifs. I can, you can, I'm pretty sure you can go without ifs. If you need an if, you probably need two tests. And avoid loops. Loops you sometimes need. But you really want to avoid them. You want to keep it simple in your tests. 
on the, on the subject of, of test method naming, um, what we often do is, is we take the class and, and we just put the suffix test behind it. That, that's fine for, for implementation detail tests like the SES email service test. Makes sense, right? But what if we apply a different pattern here? One that, that, that we actually already know. One that I, that, I, that I learned from the screaming architecture ideas. Right? Screaming architecture is about that your code base screams the domain to you, not the technical stuff. In the same way, I think it's valuable if our test classes scream the behavior at you, if they're behavioral tests, of course. Because an invoice service test doesn't tell me much. I know it's probably backed by an invoice service, hooray. But, okay, bad example, a pay invoice feature test. Yeah, you can pay an invoice. Who would have guessed that, right? But if I had something like this, and, and I was browsing through the test packages and clicked it open, and I saw a list of those things that actually describe the behavior, this, this tells me so much more. And you may not like the feature test suffix. I know it's quite lengthy, and, and you repeat yourself, but then come, that's not the gist of it. The thing is that it actually screams the behavior at you. And when we open such a test class and, and look at the test methods, what I often find is, and I did it myself constantly, that I describe what I am testing. Here are two examples of, of, of what test. Test expire invoice. And then I wonder what happens actually when an invoice expires. I don't know the rules of it. I really, you force me to read that method just to understand the behavior of an invoice expiring. Or the last one, add pineapple topping to pizza test. Now I wonder, I hope it's not allowed. I don't know. You force me to read this method. And yes, in a way, they're trivial examples, but I can't put complex examples on, on, on the slides. But what you want to do is not what you're testing. You want to describe why the test is there. Because the why captures the behavior. So if I, if I would have rewritten those two tests, I would have written something like an unexpired invoice should expire automatically after 30 days of the publication date. And notice something. There are underscores there. I would never do that in, in production code. That's not the Java way, but I really, I'm a bit dyslectic, so it helps me if I split things up into logical blocks and an underscore really helps because this is a rather short test method even. Sometimes they're even longer if I really want to describe it. Or the last one. Pineapple is an illegal topping, luckily, and should prevent the cook from adding it. I know the behavior. I know what's going on. I don't even need to read the contents of the method. You want to avoid giving examples in your test method names. And here is an example of a test or a set of tests that give, that give examples. Uh, should consider ABC as a as weak password. Okay? The second one is slightly better because I already know why it's weak. Should consider ABC as a too short password. But then I question, like, okay, is A, B, C, D then not too short? Like, I don't know the rules at play here. And this is something we constantly do. And I, I'm doing it myself, too, because you're so focused on, the, on, on implementing it, you just quickly write the name down. And we never, like, uh, step back to the test method name. But sometimes if I look at the test method names I wrote a month ago without really being uh, attent attentive to it, I'm finding myself writing stuff like that. I, what you want to do is avoid giving examples. So let's re rewrite those two test method names. You want to, you fo again, focus on the behavior. Should consider passwords too short. When having a length, again, underscores, I want to make it clear, of eight or less. And the way I would have written it is the last one. Just simply, minimum length of a password is eight. That's it. It's clear. And if you want to document your code, if you want your test code to have any kind of documentation value, you really need, should focus on, on communicating clearly. Remember what I said in the, um, in the beginning of this section, avoid abstractions? 
Well, we should also embrace magic numbers. I would never embrace magic numbers and strings in my production code. You put that in constants, right? High above the class. Well, in test codes, different contexts, different rules. Let's look at the following test. So we, we have a VAT calculator, and, and we get some VAT amount out of there, or calculate it. Uh, but the important thing is the yellow constants. I do all this based on a gross price and a VAT percentage, and I expect some amount out of there. And then I run the test, and suddenly I see something like expected 21, but was 22. And I have no idea where these values are coming from. If I open the test, you again force me away out of the test. In tests, you want to embrace magic numbers. You want to avoid all kind of, even the simplest layers of abstraction and just put the numbers there. Because it's so obvious to immediately spot what this test is about and undoing. Of course, the, the tax amount of 121 with 21% of tax is 21. For the last section of this talk, I would like us to look together at the following test. It's again around invoices. And first, if we want to test an invoice, we need an invoice, right? So and to, to need an invoice, you need to have a billing address, apparently, and a shipping address, and you need to have some kind of items in there, and, and a customer. And then we finally have, have this invoice. And then we get the VAT amount of, out of there, and then we just say uh, it needs to meet 42. Well, that's fairly simple, right? Because if you look again at the yellow numbers, yeah, 21 plus 21 is 42, right? It's simple. But this is a pattern that we're constantly doing. Um, it's having big chunks in our given part. Because if you want to prove this test, the first thing to note is that a good test exists out of three parts. Given, when, then. Arrange, act, assert. That's the first thing I think about when writing a test. What is my given? What is my when? What is my then? And when I have identified them, I make three blocks in my code. I don't want like this big wall of text. Obviously, the given part and the third part are at the top and at the bottom, but sometimes I need to scan what is actually being tested. I need to find that one method. But just visually dividing it and adding little comments, since that's what I like to do, um, makes it clear. Well, we can even improve on that, I think. Because that, that first part is quite lengthy, and actually all we care about for this test is the invoice items. And this is something I do a lot. Like, let's, let's just imagine this is the first invoice test I, I wrote, and this is the first one. And I'm done, and I need to write my second one. What do I do? Copy and paste. Right? And then I just alter some other values in there, and I keep on repeating and doing that. And my colleague will do the same. And when I open that invoice service test class, what do I find? Lots and lots of text. And it's all clutter. What you want to do is apply something like the object model pattern. I wrote a small blog post about that if you want to dive deeper into it. But what the object mother allows you to do, and it's a pattern from Martin Fowler, so it, it's definitely great. Um, it allows us to emphasize on what matters and hide all the irrelevant stuff. And that previous chunk, that given chunk, now looks like this. You may not, some, some colleagues say, I don't, like, I don't like mother as a suffix. I don't know. I like my mother, so I use it. Um, but so you start with that object that you want to build, and, and we use mother a lot, so, because the pattern is called the same way, so why not? And then you give it a static factory method. And that does not simply return an invoice. It's not something that some, some people call a generator, no. It returns a builder. And it doesn't stop there. It returns a pre-filled builder that allows you to overwrite what is relevant. That's very important. I'm, I'm just saying invoice mother gave me a valid invoice, and I want to just change the invoice items, because that's relevant for my test. The shipping address, all the other stuff that is like mandatory for your object, is already default, has default stuff. You don't need to worry about it. And then you can happily copy-paste that and remove whatever you need or don't need. When I'm applying this pattern in code bases, what I often see colleagues do is the following. And then I, I realized they didn't understand it, really. <laughs> 
they're, they're keeping adding these static factory methods. They call them then sometimes in the boss team, they call them generators. Uh, no, you want to limit it. You, you only need a couple of, of, of static factory methods, and then you just override what you need. So, so for example, uh, the, the second one, valid invoice with US shipping address. If you want that, no, you just start with a valid invoice, and you override the shipping address. And there's a neat little trick you can do uh, with the Java Util Consumer, but that's, that's in my blog. Um, but this, this makes it clear. So you really avoid static factory methods. So that previous test, that, that chunky test, now looks like this. Change is inevitable, and, and, and that, is, that is why we test. We want to adapt, we want to evolve our software. And lots of things change, not only requirements. And, and we want to test behavior, and to a lesser extent, our code implementation details. And we need to accept that tests live in different contexts, and, and that is how we should test things. Uh, test and production code should be equal citizens in your code base. And they looked at from different contexts, and with, with equal architectural right, cared for equally equally important. And actually, I don't agree, because I think that tests are actually much more important than your production code. Without tests, you cannot involve that production code. So our emphasis should be really on the test. Thanks for listening. <laughs>